in 1897, Europeans who dressed up themselves in the clothing of Jews, these people established the Zionist movement. The stage was now set. The countdown has begun for the Jews to strike. After waiting for almost 2,000 years, they are now ready to strike to achieve their long-held objective of bringing back the Golden Age. To destroy the Khilafah, you'll have to destroy the Ottoman Empire. And you cannot destroy the Ottoman Empire with 5,000 Jews in an army. You need a world war to destroy the Ottoman Empire. That's a tall order. So what you do is you plan a conspiracy. And you stay behind so that your fingerprints are not on the crime. The attack took place in the summer of 1914 when the Grand Duke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated in Sarajevo. In the summer of 1914, there were six major powers in Europe. And there was one dark horse across the Atlantic. No one knew how fast it could run because it had never run in a race so far. And six major powers in Europe. There were number one, Russia, France, Britain, Germany, Austria, Hungary. That's five. What's number six? Ottoman Islamic Empire. These are the six major powers. How can you bring about a world war which would result in the dismantling of the Ottoman Islamic Empire? You've got to do some good planning to do this one. When they attacked and assassinated the Grand Duke Franz Ferdinand, they left footprints which led to Russia. And so Austria-Hungary had no option but to declare war on Russia. But Britain and France already had a treaty a defense treaty with Russia. And so Britain and France now had to declare war in favor of Russia against Austria-Hungary. But Germany has the same racial ties with Austria-Hungary, so Germany is now forced to enter the war on the side of Austria-Hungary. So they have succeeded. Whoever planned that assassination has succeeded in bringing all these powers now in Europe into a state of war. All that is left now is what they call the sick man of Europe, Ottoman Islamic Empire. The Khalifa in Istanbul does not want to enter the war. He knows how weak the Ottoman army is in terms of military technology. But through internal intrigue within Istanbul, the Ottoman Empire is forced into the war and a Russian ship in the Bosphorus is used as a pretext. It is in 1916 that Jassasa went to work, British spies in Arabia. Lawrence of Arabia, of course, is the most well known of them. These British spies were sent into Arabia, posing as Muslims, and they went to two actors in Arabia. One was Sharif al Hussein, who was appointed by the Khalifa in Istanbul as the Sharif of the Hejaz, Makkah and Medina, in control. Makkah was under the control of an Arab battalion, but Medina was under the control of a Turkish battalion. So when the British spies went to Hussein, they offered him the moon. We will liberate the land of the hated Ottoman Turks, and we will give you independence and freedom and you will now become the king of the Arabs. Remember, Britain is not talking about Khilafah. Eh? No, no, we'll make you the king of the Arabs. And we also prepared to offer you a little, you know what, just seven million pounds. Seven million pounds at that time is what Bill Gates has now. Sharif Hussein, the great-great-grandfather of Abdullah, then betrayed the Prophet Muhammad Islam betrayed 1400 years of history of this ummah violated the plain and clear command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Quran in suratul maida and this is precisely what sharif hussein did 
and what all his descendants from that day to this day have been doing. Sharif Hussein now accepts seven million sterling pounds and enters into a military alliance with Britain and declares himself independent of the Ottoman Khalifa. Once the Khilafa in Istanbul had lost control of Mecca and Medina, had lost control of the Haramain, had lost control of the Hajj, you pull the carpet from underneath the feet of the Khalifa. His Khilafa is now losing legitimacy. And so the British calculated, if we can wrest control of the Haramain and the Hajj away from the Khalifa in Istanbul, then the legitimacy of his Khilafa will begin to crumble. If you want to destroy the Khilafa, you have to make sure that it cannot be restored. How can you take the entire world of Islam with so many ulama and ensure that not only is the Khilafa destroyed, but it cannot be restored? That's a tall order. How to do it? The answer is, you not only have to liberate the Haramain from the control of the Khalifa in Istanbul, but you have to put it in the control of those who will not themselves claim the Khilafa and will not allow anyone else to claim the Khilafa. And so long as these people keep control of the Haramain and the Hajj, the Khilafa can never be restored. Simple, isn't it? And so that was why they had to make the trip to Riyadh to meet Abdul Aziz Ibn Saud. Correct name? Of course it's the correct name. But Abdul Aziz Ibn Saud did not control the Hijaz. So he couldn't command the check for seven million pounds. He had to be content with something less than that. So what the British offered to him was if you would sign the same kind of agreement with us and violate the specific command in the Quran and betray Allah and his messenger and betray the Ummah, we pay you 5,000 pounds a month. Would you accept that? Abdul Aziz says yes. And in 1916, Abdul Aziz ibn Saud signed an agreement with Britain which made of him a military ally of Britain subservient to Britain. But when the Ikhwan, who were his military force, questioned him, how can you sign this agreement with Britain? And how can you accept this money from Britain, 5,000 pounds a month? Abdul Aziz ibn Isaw says, this is jizya. Jizya is what they pay to me because I control them. It was dust in their eyes and they swallowed it. And so Abdul Aziz ibn Saud got away with it. By 1919, the Ottoman Empire was in shambles, falling apart. And a British army under General Allenby, with many Arabs and Punjabi Muslims fighting faithfully under his control, attacked the Turkish garrison which was defending Jerusalem, defeated it, and liberated the Holy Land. This was a joyous day for the Jews because now the countdown is really moving forward and the golden age is coming back. In the same 1919, when the Ottoman Empire is collapsing and it is losing all its non-Turkish possessions, all the Arab parts of the Ottoman Empire are falling away, the Greek army now invades the Turkish mainland, Anatolia. And the Turkish people now have a tremendous fright in their hearts because the Greeks hate them with a PhD in hatred. So Britain now has to create a Turkish general who would appear to the Turkish people as a savior who has come down from the heavens with his hands resting on the wings of angels to save the Turkish people. And so at a place called Gallipoli, a man named Mustafa Kemal inflicts a defeat on the ruling state in the world, Britain, and immediately climbs the ladder to become the hero of all heroes in Turkish history. 
Mustafa Kamal now takes over. He is in fact de facto ruler over the Ottoman Empire. And the Khalifa is just a piece of furniture. In 1920, I think, or 21, there was a big treaty, uh, negotiations in Versailles. And from this emerged now the Turkish Republic, which replaces the Ottoman Islamic State. But Mustafa Kemal said, the Turkish people love their Khalifa. So if Europe could have a Pope, why can't we have a Pope too? So the new Turkish government of Mustafa Kemal decided to take the Khilafa and remove from it all political authority and make the Khalifa the equivalent of the Pope. This was 1922. And things were going fine for him. Turkish people were happy. Khilafa is still there. And the leadership of the revolution in Turkey were very happy because we have a secular state now, a model after the European state. But in 1924, on the 3rd of March, suddenly Britain demanded of Mustafa Kemal that he must abolish the Khilafah. The demand came from Britain. And on the 3rd of March, 1924, the Turkish Republic abolished the Khilafah. The question we have to ask is, why did they do it when there was no need to do it? Nothing. It represented no threat whatsoever to the secular Turkish Republic. The answer for the abolition of the Khilafah on the 3rd of March 1924 is located in a place called India. When the attack on the Khilafah was taking place in the 1916, 17, 18 period, then Indian ulama, at that time the Indian Muslim community, was one of the most influential Muslim communities in the world. And the Indian Muslim community was led by leaders who knew Islam and lived Islam. And they wanted to get rid of British imperial rule in India. So that when they got rid of the British, they could restore Islamic rule over Muslims. That's all they wanted. And they realized that they could mobilize the Muslim masses of India over this issue of the Khilafah because everybody loved the Khilafah. And so they establish a movement which they call the Khilafat movement, Harakatul Khilafah. When they established the Khilafat movement and it began to mobilize the Muslim masses, the body which was sleeping is now waking up for revolutionary struggle to preserve the Khilafah in Istanbul. The leader of the Hindus realized, but wait a minute, the Muslims want the same thing that we want. We also want the Hindus, we want to get rid of the British, and we want to restore Hindu rule over the Hindus. So there's a conversion of interest here. So Gandhi, who later became known as Mahatma Gandhi, Gandhi approached the leadership of the Khilafat movement, and he said to them, listen, the same thing you want, the same thing I want. So why don't we join forces? Will you allow me to join the Khilafat movement? They accepted the offer of Gandhi and they formed an alliance. And so the Khilafat movement in India now became a Hindu-Muslim alliance. This constituted the most dangerous of all threats that Western civilization have ever experienced in its entire period of colonization of mankind. This Khilafat movement. Because the Western objective was to demolish every existing state structure in the world and replace it with the secular state. So that the, eventually the secular state could be brought under the umbrella of a League of Nations and eventually a United Nations. And this would be political globalization at work. Between 1920 and 1924, the Khilafat movement was building up steam at an alarming rate. And by 1924, the British had calculated, we have to get rid of this Khilafat movement. And the only way we can think of now is to abolish the Khilafat. And so they put the pressure on Mustafa Kemal. As soon as the Khilafat was abolished, the Khilafat movement in India began to lose steam. When the Caliphate was abolished, 
Sharif al Hussein realized that he was in grave danger now. So long as there was a Khalifa in Istanbul, the British needed him. But now that the Caliphate was destroyed, abolished, Sharif al Hussein now realizes the plan. He says, Oh my gosh, they're going to send Abdulaziz ibn Saud to cut my throat now. So Sharif al Hussein decides four days later, on the 7th of March 1924, to claim the Khilafah for himself. But when you're a client state of Britain, you can't do that. You have to first apply to the British government for permission to become the Khalifa. He didn't do that. As soon as Sharif al Hussein claimed the Khilafat for himself on the 7th of March 1924, Britain gave the green light to Abdul Aziz. Attack. Within six months, army of Abdul Aziz ibn Saud conquered Makkah. And Sharif Hussein packed his suitcase and off he went. And so Abdul Aziz ibn Saud is now in control of Makkah and eventually Medina. In April of 1924, Al Azhar University had responded to the Turkish abolition of the Khilafah. What did they do? Al Azhar University declared that this was bid'ah and haram to abolish the Khilafah. And therefore we must respond to it. And the response of Al Azhar is that we must have a mu'tamar, a conference which would meet and which would appoint a new Khalifa. As soon as Al-Azhar issued this proclamation, you could see how Britain was trembling. They got to plan some counter strategy to the initiative of Al-Azhar University. The counter strategy is that Egypt is itself not a free country. It may appear free, but Britain really has control over Egypt. So for two years, the conference can't take place. Two years because of British pressure. The conference finally takes place in June, July of 1926. But Britain uses another counter strategy. She gets Abdul Aziz ibn Saud in Makkah to also convene a conference of the world of Islam in Makkah at the time of the Hajj, which is May of 1926. And then Britain and Russia and France and China and all the major powers in Europe all get to work. Massive intervention in the affairs of the world of Islam to ensure that the Cairo conference does not succeed in winning a representative gathering and that the Makkah conference gets all the Muslims attending it. And they succeeded. The Cairo conference organized by Al-Azhar University becomes an essentially Arab conference because non-Arabs are hardly present. The conference met. The conference decided that the Khilafah was an essential part of the deen, that it was bid'ah and haram to abolish it, that the Khilafah must be restored, but we don't know how to do it. So let's go back home and come back after one year. That was the decision. We don't know how to do it. But in Makkah, you had the most successful representation of the entire world of Islam, because Britain really went to work on it. This conference is now convened, but strangely, for the Wahhabi movement, which is a religious movement, which declares that it is bringing back the original Islam and removing all the extraneous things which had been added. And cutting out all the shirk. So this is the real Islam. Well then how come you don't even have the subject of the Khilafah in your agenda for your conference? Instead, Abdul Aziz ibn Saud approaches the conference twice, himself in person. And he asks the conference to recognize him as Al-Malik. That his rule should be recognized over the Hijaz. When the conference had heard his Majesty the King on both occasions and the conference is now sitting down to discuss the matter shall we recognize Saudi Wahhabi rule over the Hijaz the leader of the Indian Muslim delegation jumped up to speak first he spoke first his name was Maulana Muhammad Ali Jauhar he got up and he told the King get lost we'll never do that as soon as the leadership of the Indian Muslim delegation had established his position of rejecting the claim 
of the Saudi Wahhabi leadership for sovereignty and control over the Hejaz, the rest of the delegates couldn't say, mm. that was the power of a man who knew Islam and lived Islam. And so the conference ended without giving to the Saudi Wahhabi rule over the Hejaz recognition. They decided that they'll meet every year, but that was the last time they ever met. This then was the response of the world of Islam to the abolition of the Khilafah.